Hello again, Econ 160. It's Professor Kung here, coming to you again in the midst of the COVID-19 global pandemic. It's currently March 21st, 2020. It's now been 10 days since CSUN officially transitioned to online only, and two days since Governor Newsom issued the stay-at-home order to all Californians. As of today, there have been over 23,000 confirmed cases of coronavirus in the U.S. with no sign of slowing down. But alas, learning must go on. So here I am coming to you with another video. This time, we're going to talk about firms in perfectly competitive markets. In order to keep each video shorter and more easily digestible, I've decided to break up my lectures into two shorter videos each. Uh, so this video is going to be just the first half of this lecture. Today's motivating observation is about market dynamics. If we look at real life markets, let's say the restaurant industry, what we see is that they are constantly evolving. Every year, some firms enter the market and some firms exit. Infant industries, like the marijuana industry, are often characterized by soaring profits and a rush of young firms seeking to enter the market. But mature industries, like let's say automobiles, are usually characterized by a pretty stable number of firms and in these industries, significant profit growth can be hard to come by. So in today's lecture, we're going to address a couple of questions. First, at the firm level, how do firms decide when to enter a market and when to leave? Second, um, we're going to transition from the firm level to the market level and ask, how do the collective decision making of these individual firms shape the outcomes of the market as a whole over time? And finally, from a big picture societal perspective, what do these dynamics imply for the efficiency of markets over time? All right, the context we'll be focusing on today is perfectly competitive markets. Remember, we defined perfectly competitive markets before. And uh, do you remember how we defined them? Uh, so if you'll recall, we made two assumptions about perfectly competitive markets. First, that all goods bought and sold in the market are exactly identical. And second, that there are a lot of buyers and a lot of sellers. So much so that no individual buyer or individual seller can influence the market price on their own. And today, since we're interested in market dynamics specifically, uh, and by the way, dynamics is just a fancy way of saying how something changes over time, we're going to add an additional third assumption, that buyers and sellers can freely enter or exit the market. So if there are profits to be had, then there's nothing stopping a potential entrepreneur from coming in and setting up shop. On the other hand, if business is bad, there's nothing stopping existing sellers from shutting down either. Okay, before diving deeper into firm behavior, let me take a brief moment to talk about other types of markets besides perfectly competitive markets. Because uh, perfectly competitive markets, while being the simplest to analyze, and a good approximation to lots of markets, it isn't always the most realistic set of assumptions. The two most important defining features of markets are A, the number of buyers and sellers, and B, the degree of product differentiation. Uh, and product differentiation is just a fancy way of saying how similar or different the products being sold are. So when there are many buyers and sellers and products are identical, then we have perfect competition as we already discussed. An example of a perfectly competitive market is most commodity markets like the market for soybeans. And by the way, in economic jargon, a commodity is a basic good that is interchangeable with other goods of the same type. Uh, so there's your exactly identical assumption part of it. And when there are many buyers and sellers, but each seller's product is somewhat different uh, from the others, then we have what's called monopolistic competition. And I would say that most markets we're used to thinking about fall under the category of monopolistic competition. A good example of monopolistic competition would be the market for automobiles, uh, or the market for books, or the market for video games. 
anything in which the products all serve uh, a similar purpose but are also slightly different from each other uh, would usually fall under monopolistic competition. Now, when the market is dominated by a single supplier, then we would call that market a monopoly, and the single supplier would be called a monopolist. Monopolies arise when it's difficult or impossible for potential competitors to enter the market successfully for various reasons that we'll learn more about uh, in a future lecture. A good example of a monopoly today is the market for internet search, which is dominated by, you guessed it, Google. Then when we have markets where products are identical, but the market is controlled by just a handful of suppliers, then we would call those markets oligopolies. The market for oil is an example of an oligopoly with just a handful of suppliers in each country. And so oftentimes in oligopolies, strategic interactions between the suppliers become very important, which is why investors follow the, uh, the decisions of OPEC very closely. Uh, and finally, if the market is dominated by a single buyer, then we would call that market a monopsony. Okay, monopsony. An example of a monopsony would be the market for fighter jets. Uh, in the U.S. at least, the only purchaser of fighter jets is the U.S. government. And so we have multiple suppliers, uh, but just a single buyer. And altogether, the subfield of economics that studies how different markets function depending on their characteristics is called industrial organization, or I.O. And I.O. economists are experts in uh, how firms behave and interact. And so they might be hired as business consultants to help a company think through strategic issues or they might even be hired by the government to help predict the results of mergers and acquisitions and run models to see whether that would be beneficial or harmful to consumers. Uh, it's definitely one of the more practical fields of economics that you could focus on. Okay, now back to perfectly competitive markets. We're now going to start thinking about how firms behave in perfectly competitive markets and we're going to make the following assumptions about the firms. First, we're going to assume that the firm's goal is to maximize its economic profits. Uh, now, before you say, well, not all firms are always trying to maximize profits, remember that we have a pretty broad definition of what we mean by economic profit. Uh, it includes both the accounting profit, but it also includes the opportunity cost. And so it's actually a fairly broad and reasonable assumption. Second, uh, we assume that firms take the market price as given, so they assume that nothing they do on their own can directly influence the market price. Uh, this is also a fairly reasonable assumption, as long as there are many other sellers and as long as products are identical. Third, we assume that in the short run, firms have costs that are fixed, things like the rent they pay for their office space, and since they have to pay those costs regardless of what they do, the fixed costs don't influence their decision making in the short run. Instead, they make decisions in the short run based on revenues and on the variable costs. Finally, we assume that in the long run, firms are free to enter or exit the market. If fixed costs are very high and this is killing the firm, then even if they're still operating in the short run, they may decide to exit in the long run. And similarly, over the long run, we assume that new firms can enter uh, if there are profits to be had. And as usual, the definition of short run and long run may vary depending on the market. If entering or exiting the market can be very quick, like in the restaurant business, then short run might be a month and long run might be a quarter or half a year. On the other hand, if entering or exiting the market takes a long time, maybe because of uh, very expensive capital investments, like let's say in the auto industry, then short run may be a year and long run may be multiple years. It just depends on, uh, on the speed with which capital can be acquired or liquidated. Now let's see how a firm behaves in the short run. Here on the right, I'm showing you the cost functions of a firm. And suppose the market price is $12. How much quantity will this firm choose to produce? To answer this question, you first have to remember that profits are maximized when marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Remember that? 
And what's marginal revenue for a price-taking firm? It's just the price, since the amount of revenue the firm gets for each additional unit sold is just the market price for that good. So let's draw a horizontal line at the price of $12. Where does this intersect marginal cost? At a quantity of 12. So the firm is going to choose to produce 12 units. And so what will revenue, total cost, and total profit be? To calculate revenue, you simply have to realize that revenue is equal to the quantity produced times the price. So that's 12 times 12 equals 144. And what's total cost? Total cost is average total cost times the quantity produced. But what's average total cost? Well, when the quantity is produced is 12, we can draw this line down and see that the average total cost when quantity is 12 is right here, $10. So the average total cost is 10, and thus total cost is 12 times 10 equals 120. And finally, what's the profit? Profit is revenue minus total cost. So that's 144 minus 120 equals 24. Now, there's a graphical representation for profit, which is this rectangle right here, bounded above by the price and below by the average total cost, and it has length equal to the quantity produced. Okay, now let's ask what the same firm would do if the market price were seven. First, we ask what quantity would maximize profits, assuming the firm chooses to produce anything at all. Well, profits will be maximized where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And since marginal revenue equals price for the competitive firm, profits are maximized when price equals marginal cost. Since price is seven, then the profit maximizing quantity would be seven as well. Uh, so now let's calculate revenue, total cost, variable cost, total profit, and variable profit at a quantity of seven. Revenue is price times quantity, so that's equal to 49. Total cost is average total cost times quantity, and average total cost at Q equals 7 is 9. So total cost is 9 times 7 equals 63. Variable cost is average variable cost times quantity, and average variable cost is 5. So variable cost is 5 times 7, 35. And finally, total profit is simply revenue minus total cost. So that's minus 14. And variable profit is revenue minus variable cost, which is plus 14. OK, so now, should the firm continue to produce in the short run? Well, since the fixed costs are sunk, meaning the firm has to pay the fixed costs anyway, regardless of whether it produces anything, uh, so in order to decide whether to produce in the short run, the firm only compares revenue to variable cost. Since revenue is higher than variable cost, the firm will continue to produce seven quantity this period, even though it's taking a loss overall. But because it is taking a loss, if prices don't change, then the firm is preparing to exit in the long run. Finally, let's see what happens when the firm faces a market price of two. Where does price equal marginal cost? At a quantity of two. Revenue is price times quantity, so that's two times two equals four. Total cost is average total cost times quantity, and average total cost is 12. And so total cost is 12 times two equals 24. Variable cost is average variable cost times quantity. Average variable cost is 4.5. And so variable cost is 4.5 times 2 equals 9. Altogether, that means that total profit is 4 minus 24. That's minus 20. And variable profit is 4 minus 9. That's minus 5. So should this firm continue to produce in the short run? In this case, no. The amount of revenue that it could earn is even less than its variable costs, 
So it's better off not producing anything in the short run and just eating its fixed costs until it has a chance to exit in the long run. Okay, let's summarize what we've learned so far about firm behavior in the short run of a perfectly competitive market. And it all depends on where P equals MC is in relation to the ATC and the AVC curve. So if P equals MC, that is where the price intersects the marginal cost, is above the ATC curve, then the firm is making positive short run profits. Okay, on the other hand, if P equals MC is below the ATC curve, but above the AVC curve, then the firm is making short run losses, okay? Uh, but these losses are going to be mainly due to high fixed costs, which the firm can't do anything about in the short run. And since its revenues are still higher than its variable costs, the firm is going to continue to produce but it is preparing to exit in the long run, especially if prices don't change. Okay, and so our third case is if P equals MC is actually below the AVC curve, okay, then the firm actually won't choose to produce anything, okay, because it's not only is it making short run losses, but the amount of revenue that it could make wouldn't even be enough to cover its variable costs. So in this case, the firm uh, is going to produce nothing in the short run. It's going to eat its fixed costs in the short run, and it's going to prepare to exit in the long run. Okay, so that's it for the first half of this lecture, uh, where we looked at individual firm behavior in the short run of a perfectly competitive market. In the second half of the lecture, we'll think about how uh, long-run dynamics work, and we'll think about the relationship between individual firm behavior and overall market outcomes.